So I would also like to start by expressing my gratitude to the organizers of this very stimulating uh, symposium. It's just wonderful to be here and hear so many people talking about something I've become very interested in in the, in the last few years. The last major milestone in the seven million years of hominid evolution is the emergence of modern humans or homo sapiens, people who for the first time fundamentally looked and behaved like us. While a date of around 200,000 years ago was frequently given for this dynamic, there is still substantial debate regarding the timing as something that was an ongoing process rather than a single point in geological time. Anatomically, it is widely recognized that facial size reduction or gracilization or feminization as it is sometimes called, as well as facial retraction are key defining traits for our species. And while not all specialists might agree, I would argue that many of the more detailed modern craniofacial traits, like the presence of a chin, are largely secondary consequences of this reduction in facial size. While there is broad agreement on this anatomical pattern, there remains a major unresolved question regarding what evolutionary process or processes produce craniofacial reduction in our species. A number of evolutionary explanations have been suggested. One of the most pervasive is that fire in cooking reduced the need for extra oral food processing, which led to reduced muscle size and force, and thus reduced skeletal size and robusticity in modern humans. This idea has a long history in paleoanthropology. But as Richard Wrangham has argued recently, fire use precedes the advent of modernity with evidence for fire use in Homo erectus as early as 1.5 million years ago. And even those that contest early use of fire still argue for regular fire use in cooking by 400,000 years ago, a time period that also precedes modern humans. Other explanations like the idea that facial retraction produces an optimum one-to-one -one ratio between the length of the vertical and horizontal components of the vocal tract, thus aiding speech production, while true, could just as easily be a secondary result of facial retraction rather than its cause. There are several other explanations that have been pro proposed that have similar weaknesses. In fact, I would argue that there are sufficient shortcomings in all of the selective explanations that have been posited to date to warrant considering other alternative explanations. And that brings up the possibility of what you've been hearing today, um, uh, self-domestication in dogs and some interesting anatomical parallels in wolf-to-dog evolution and pre-modern to modern humans regarding craniofacial changes. Dogs also exhibit less projecting faces and more delicate skulls compared to their wolf ancestors. The self-domestication model as it applies to dogs and some other organisms, in its simplest terms, is that wild animals may domesticate when tame behavior enhances their survival near humans. Tolerating the presence of humans requires reduced levels of fear and natural aggression, and selection for reduced aggression can have correlated effects on morphology, physiology, and other aspects of behavior and psychology. The well-known long-term study of silver foxes in Russia that you just heard a great deal about in which wild foxes have been selectively bred for over 50 years based entirely on lack of, a fear, lack of fear and aggression towards humans has provided a key linchpin in understanding dog domestication. This work has allowed inferences from prehistoric empirical patterns in dogs to be compared to actual experimental tests of these inferences. As the silver fox researchers have shown, and as you've been hearing about, Domestication produces important neurotransmitter changes. It's widely recognized that elevated serotonin levels are linked to the inhibition of aggressive behavior. And early on, it was uh, learned in the Fox experiments that tryptophan hydroxylase, the key enzyme in serotonin synthesis, serotonin synthesis, was much higher in the tame foxes compared to the wild ones. And also, as you've heard about, basal and stress-induced cortisol levels three to five times lower and domesticated foxes. There are key implications for these experiments for both dog and human evolution. Impeding the de development of the neurophysiological substrate of fear or aggression stems from the regulatory effects of genes affecting growth rates. These genes are targeted by selection under domestication. They also regulate the growth rates of other traits, including craniofacial shape. Today, I am presenting one set of parallel comparisons between canid and hominid evolution from a larger set, 
that I, along with my chief collaborator, Scott Maddox, at the University of Missouri in Columbia, have developed in support of extending the self-domestication model to modern humans. Changes in the skull, as you've been hearing, particularly a shortened rostrum or snout, were at the leading edge of features key to the morphological transition from wolves to dogs. Genome-wide association scans of skull length in dogs demonstrates that multiple quantitative trait loci are strongly associated with variation in face length. Here we use nasion procyon as a measure of facial height or length, and bazion procyon as a measure of facial projection across separate brain case and facial modules. A relatively wider rostrum and wider zygomatic arches also characterize dogs compared to ancestral wolves. Accordingly, we included bizygomatic breadth in our comparisons. We also compare biorbital breadth across the lateral orbital margins because this measure is often available when the zygomatic arches are damaged or missing in fossil hominins, and because it appears less sensitive than ZYB to environmental modifications, particularly in HOMO. For the raw dimensions in our hominins, our maximum sample size in pre-modern HOMO, which ranged from early to late Pleistocene, is 30. The maximum early anatomically modern human sample associated with Middle Stone Age or Mousterian technology is seven. And the late anatomically modern human sample is 106. Virtually all of these taken on original specimens by myself uh, or Scott. For canids, we collected measurements on a total of 54 individuals. These included 21 wolves and 19 modern dogs from the mammalogy collections at the Field Museum in Chicago. There are potential problems with relying exclusively on modern dogs in our study. The main concern is that intense pedigreed breeding over the past 140 years was based on selection for distinctive morphology, as, again, as you've been hearing. This has resulted in an astonishing array of morphological diversity. And this is reflected in our field museum sample, which included a large range of size and shape, from a St. Bernard on one end of the range to a very small terrier. Hunter-gatherer dogs, in contrast, tend to show far less variation across their geographic ranges. The same is true for feral dogs around the world, indicating that behavior, rather than selection for specific body types, is what was occurring for the vast majority of time in which dogs evolved from wolves. Prehistoric dogs may be more relevant in testing the self-domestication model in the same way that late Pleistocene, early Holocene human samples are often more relevant as comparators to archaic fossil humans than our urbanized, industrialized humans. Accordingly, we also collected data sets on some of the earliest and best preserved domesticated dogs in the New World. These were all archaeologically recovered from intentional burials dating between four to 5,000 years ago from the Native American archaic period Kentucky Green River Valley site complex. We combed through a collection of hundreds of burials to find a maximum of 19 individuals with well-preserved mandibles and associated postcrania, and 15 of these individuals also preserved relatively complete crania. This slide summarizes the percent change in median facial widths facial heights, and facial projection in our sample from ancestral starting values. Biorbital breadth in dogs decreases from wolves by 24%, and bizygomatic breadth decreases by 27%. Dog facial height decreases from wolves to the greatest degree, makes sense, by 32%, with bazion procyon length decreasing to the next greatest degree at 28%. The late anatomically modern humans show similar patterns of size reduction when compared to pre-modern samples. Also reducing the most in facial height, 21%, and then facial projection next by 17%, both of their facial widths reduce at more modest levels of 7%. In contrast, the early anatomically modern sample shows no percent decrease at all in facial widths, even increasing to a modest degree in biorbital breadth. The early anatomically modern human sample does show approximately 9% decrease in facial height and projection from pre-moderns. Gross observations of living wolves indicates larger heads in comparisons to body size than dogs. However, directly measured skulls and associated postcranial skeletal studies are lacking across the genus Canis, with body mass instead usually tautologically estimated from skull dimension. Although it is not widely appreciated or studied, pre-modern humans 
also had larger heads in comparison to body size than modern humans. And for mid to late Pleistocene human evolution, species differences mostly manifest in the head and not the body. Therefore, even though it results in considerably smaller sample sizes, for example, only Neanderthals representing pre-modern Homo, it is important to consider facial measurements standardized to associated femoral head diameter as a reasonably good proxy for body mass in canids and hominins, and compare these to results obtained on the raw facial dimensions across our samples that I just showed you. When log by orbital breadth, is regressed on, against long, log femoral head diameter in our canid sample fitted with least squares regression lines, the combined extant and prehistoric dog line is not significantly different from the wolf line in either the slope or the y-intercept. Both dog lines are shown here for visual comparison. All canids in our sample follow a similar negative uh, allometric scaling pattern. Here are those same variables plotted for hominins with a line fitted to the late anatomically modern human sample yielding a, a significant slope that is also negatively allometric. Note that the 95% late anatomically modern human confidence limits include the early anatomically modern human Kafsa 9 individual and two Neanderthals, La Ferrisi 1 and La Chapelle. Trinkus, Ruff, and others have cogently argued that body breadth differences should be factored into body mass predictions or proxies for Neanderthals. If this was done, all of the Neanderthals would move to the right in the plot to some degree, and it is likely that Chanadar 5 and possibly Amud 1 would then fall in the late anatomically modern human 95% confidence limits as well. Like the Canids, hominin by orbital breadth is scaling along a body size vector. Removing female specimens denoted here in the slide does not alter this pattern. In contrast, when we scale nasion prostheon length against femoral head diameter and log space, we get a very different result. The combined dog line and wolf lines are significantly different in slope and y-intercepts. This means that most dogs have snout lengths that are significantly smaller than would be expected for a wolf of that body size. The dog and wolf lines only converge in the largest body sizes. Note that the prehistoric dogs have particularly short snouts in comparison to wolves. And this canid pattern is paralleled in the hominid comparison for these measures. The line fitted to the late anatomically modern human sample is shown, but it is not significantly different from zero, and thus our sample differences manifest essentially along the y-axis as a vertical gradient. In the absence of confidence limits, we compared the pre-modern and early anatomically modern individuals against the late anatomically modern homo sample using z-scores. All of the Neanderthals, even the Tabun C1 female, as well as the Shkuhul 4 and 5 early anatomically modern individuals, are significantly larger in facial height. bayesian prostheon projection essentially shows the same pattern in, in, in canids and hominins, and the other facial width measure, bizygomatic breadth, follows the other pattern that I showed you in both groups. In light of these body size scaling results, we can further interpret our original raw data results. First, cranial width measurements scale with body size in both canids and hominins so that facial reduction in breadth is more constrained. Facial reduction in height and mid-sagittal projection, on the other hand, are freed up from scaling constraints to reduce to a greater degree. Secondly, Within the framework of our model, we conclude that self-domestication is most evident in upper Paleolithic humans rather than early Mousterian and Middle Stone Age associated humans, sometimes referred to as near moderns. This is precisely the conclusion drawn in a collaborative project with other researchers published in the, in the journal Current Anthropology earlier this year, which in part focused on the linkage, linkage between neurotransmitters and hormones that mediate aggressiveness and the effects of lower hormone levels in males leading to more gracilized or feminized faces. Moreover, even though we used a different sampling strategy in this publication, we came to the very same results in terms of the greater reduction in facial height compared to breath that you can see in the plot here. We argue that facial feminization in males after about 80,000 years ago reflects high levels of social tolerance necessary to life in higher densities 
and or greater cooperation among interconnected social bands. Kim Hill and colleagues have recently shown that among hunter-gatherer groups like the Ache and the Hadza, adults typically interact with more than 300 same-sex adults during their lifetimes. They noted that this implies an even larger social universe when opposite-sex adults and children are included. Additionally, close companions often interact with a somewhat different set of individuals, so that the total number of indirect interactants that each individual hears about repeatedly in detailed stories and might even meet sometime during their lifetime, as the authors point out, is clearly more than 1,000. When modeling the likelihood of cultural innovation based on these numbers, human foragers with large numbers of observed interactants accumulate improvements each generation, while chimpanzees with a much smaller number of lifetime interactants are not able to maintain or improve the initial cultural traits. The high number of individually known social interactants reported by Hill and colleagues is considerably higher than reported for any other primate and possibly more than any other species on Earth, as they put it. Hill and colleagues also noted it is also much greater than the predicted number of 150 significant social interactants, known as Dunbar's number, that was extrapolated from primate brain social group size regressions. It should not surprise us, as the authors further note, that humans have more relationships than their brain size alone predicts, as humans alone use language and symbolic devices to store information about potential relationships. The main reason why humans interact with so many more individuals than other apes is because human lifespans are much longer, and two, interaction between neighboring and distant residential social units is extensive. There is substantial evidence of both longer human lifespans and greater interaction and cooperation among extended social networks were not features of pre-modern humans. In light of these data presented here, I would argue that in particular, wider social networks in populations after about 80,000 years ago were the basis for the rapid spread of modern humans out of Africa and subsequent colonization of the rest of the globe. In closing, I would just like to mention that we have recently uh, come to an agreement regarding a collaborative re uh, research program with uh, some of the key people that you've already heard about with the, with the silver foxes. Um, and so what we will be doing is taking a very close look at the skeletal remains, postcranial, cranial, um, from all three of the trial groups, the, the wild, the domestic, and the aggressive strains, because Surprisingly, a lot of the differences that have been noted so far have been soft tissue differences. There has not been a lot of studies just on the skeletal material itself. So that's something we'll, that will occupy us in the next year or so. And finally, I just want to mention um, a large number of collaborators, a large number of funding agencies. And in particular, I would actually like to thank the uh, University of Iowa Orthodontics Department for funding our trip to the Fox Farm. That was a trip of a lifetime, I must tell you. If you have a chance to do it, you must do it. Thank you.